The Sea of Galilee, that lake that is right behind me, is a probably the most famous sea or lake in the world. More than two thirds of the gospel took place right here in this amazing piece of body of water that gets most of its waters from the melting snows of Mount Hermon as they flow into this lake in shape of the Jordan River. It may be a lake, yet lakes can be dangerous as well. The Sea of Galilee is located along what we call the Syrian African Rift Valley. It's a valley that goes all the way from the Syrian plateau down to Victoria Falls in Africa. And along that valley, we have several bodies of water. We've got the Sea of Galilee, got the Dead Sea, and even the Red Sea down south. In the ancient times, there was an additional body of water that does not exist anymore, and that is Lake Superior, which is a smaller lake that was in the Hula Valley up north. The Sea of Galilee in those days received much more water than it receives today, and they were much cleaner than they are today, simply because much of the dirt sunk in the bottom of the first one on its way down to the Sea of Galilee. The location of the Sea of Galilee is very unique. It is basically open to clashing of winds from four different directions. The traditional eastern winds that are mostly blowing in the afternoon, together with western breeze coming from the Mediterranean, eastern, western, adding to that, you get air coming all the way from the north and from the southern side, from the Syrian African Rift Valley, and you get a clashing point of winds sometimes from four different directions. It's interesting because not all those clashing of winds can be predicted. Yes, it is known that the afternoon brings the eastern wind, but you never know when the others will come and create a storm. And so when Jesus said to the disciples, let us cross to the other side, it was a big question. The disciples probably asked themselves, will we make it? Is it possible? It is definitely the time of the day where nobody would dare to do that. It was the afternoon and towards the evening. The Bible says in Mark chapter four, verse 35, on the same day, it's a day that Jesus already taught long time in different places around Galilee. And on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Isn't that interesting how sure Jesus was, how confident he was that they'll make it to the other side. He didn't say, let's try to cross to the other side. Maybe we'll make it to the other side. Could be that we'll be there today or not. Jesus promised them, let's cross to the other side. It is possible. I am with you. We're going to do it. The Bible says that Jesus taught with great authority. Yes, gracious words proceeded out of his mouth, but he was not a wimp. He was not someone that people looked at and laughed because it was also soft-spoken words that meant nothing. There was such an authority in the words that Jesus spoke that people were carried after him like magnet. It wasn't the outer beauty of Jesus that attracted people to him. In fact, Isaiah 53 suggests that he was not beautiful at all. It wasn't the beauty, it was the authority, it was who he was, not how he looked. And it's interesting because they all got into the boat, no one said a word, knowing that most likely if he says so, it's possible. But you know what? The Sea of Galilee sometimes can be like our lives, very unexpected. Sometimes storms can occur, sometimes Troubles and, and, and tragedies may even happen. And I believe that the disciples were ready for such a thing. They just didn't know how things are going to turn around. They were shocked when they saw the outcome of the following events. The Bible says that as they did that, other little boats were also following them and a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. I was here when a storm took place as I took one of my groups across the Sea of Galilee. And I'll never forget how high the waves were. 
Some of them were six to eight foot high in the middle of such a small lake that is just 12 miles long, six and a half miles wide, and only 150 foot deep. It is quite amazing to see such strong winds creating those high waves and, and, and really causing water to, to start entering into any boat that is there. And it's interesting because as the water started filling the boat, Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow. What an interesting thing. Jesus was not concerned. Jesus was not in panic. Jesus was in full control. When we, when we know that God is with us, when we know that we are in the good hands, we can rest assured everything is gonna be okay. Yet the disciples at that time still did not know who Jesus really is. For them, he's a teacher, he's a rabbi, he's a charismatic guy, he's a good guy. Maybe for some others, he was a guru, he was someone that it's cool to follow after. But one thing is for sure, the word God was not part of the vocabulary by which they described Jesus. And so it's interesting because they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? You see, they turned to Jesus with the title teacher. He was only a teacher for them. And they woke him up thinking that they are about to perish, thinking that they'll never make it. They did not really think about the fact that he was sure, he was absolutely doubtless that they'll make it to the other side. All they thought about is how in the world we are almost dead and he is asleep. Jesus was not angry that they woke him up. In fact, I believe it was an interesting opportunity for him to display his deity. Because what happened right now is something that changed their life. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Wow. And the funny thing is, the Bible says, once that happened, he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And then they feared exceedingly. They were more afraid once the storm was calm than before. They feared exceedingly once they realized that it's not the lack of peace in the lake that they have, it's the lack of peace in their life that they have. It's the lack of faith in their life that they have. And they feared exceedingly. You know, in those days, people did not own a Bible because Bibles were not printed yet and they were not in shapes of books. There were scrolls upon scrolls Every scroll was a different book. And it's interesting because synagogues would maybe have one copy of the entire Bible in different scrolls. The temple in Jerusalem might have more than that, but you couldn't as a private person own your own Bible. So if people wanted to really meditate on the word of God as they should, they really needed to memorize the word of God. So they would walk to a synagogue on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath day, and as they would hear the word of God uh, read to them publicly, they would try to memorize it. In fact, most of Paul's quotations of the Old Testament in his epistles were from his own memory. You can see that. So they would go to the synagogue and memorize verses. One of the most easiest book to memorize is the book of Psalms, simply because it's sort of like songs and we all know that songs are easier to remember than just chapters of other books. And so if there was one book, there was no doubt that most Jews memorized by heart. It was the book of Psalms. And when the Jewish people memorized the book of Psalms, Psalm 89 was obviously one of them. Psalm 89 is a Psalm that basically tells us exactly who is the only one that can ever calm the waves and the winds? Let me read to you from verses eight and nine. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, 
O Lord. Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. There's only one who could still the waves and the winds. He is God. So you can imagine the disciples on the boat, they just called him rabbi or teacher. Suddenly he stands up, he rebukes the wind, he rebukes the waves, and they calm down and he told them, peace, be still. The same exact word that Psalm 89 is using. There's only one conclusion that the disciples could come up with. Emmanuel, God is with us. It's not just a teacher. It's not just a rabbi. God is in the boat. Maybe that's why they feared exceedingly. You know, you're only afraid from the presence of God if you are not ready to face God. Jesus asked his disciples, where is your faith? Truly, faith is tested not in the good days, not in the peaceful days. Faith is tested in the bad and troublesome days. That's when people around you will look at you and see if your faith really is solid. Jesus asked the disciples, where is your faith? Everything is fine when I'm walking with you and everything is great. But now it's time to trust. Now it's the time to believe when the storm comes. And where is it? How come you failed now? How come it disappeared? How come I'm here with you, yet you're so afraid? Where is your faith? Interestingly enough, Jeremiah 17 verses 7 and 8 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruits. So when the heat comes, or when drought year comes, when the bad times come, then you're going to flourish. Then you're going to yield fruits. Then you're your leaves will be green and everybody will see that you're doing great if you trust in the Lord. So the trust in the Lord is important mostly in bad times. And Jesus was asking them, where is your faith? When Jesus is on the boat with us, we can cross the lake. We can cross any lake in the chapters of our lives. In fact, we need to uh, remember that the presence of Jesus is what Christianity is all about. It's not the absence of troubles or the absence of trials. Christianity is not the absence of troubles. Christianity is the presence of Christ. We will walk through troubles. We will walk through trials. We will walk through tribulations if He is with us. If we chose to trust Him and him alone. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world.